What's up, all of our campuses? Fremont, Sunnyvale, San Jose, those of you online. Man, it's good to be back. I've been gone for almost one month, and I got to do some cool stuff this month. My wife and I celebrated 20 years of marriage. Isn't that cool? So we got to go to Santorini for a week and spend time with actually uh, pastors Andy and Stacy, uh, our founding pastors here at Echo, and it was such a good time together. Then we went for a week to the north of Brazil, and we joined the Echo Church mission trip that was serving our partners in that region and had an amazing time. There were 22 of us on that trip together, serving together, and it was amazing. And then I got to do something very unique, went for one week to the south of Brazil, and I took my two oldest boys that we adopted to go meet their biological family after almost over a decade of seeing them. And it was a very emotional time, but very healing and beautiful. And I want to thank those of you that followed us online and that kept up and encouraged us. It was an amazing time. So we've been in this series called Images of God, and I've loved the series. I hope you enjoyed Pastor John Orberg in week one as he talked about God the Father, and then Pastor Ray Hudson from Berkeley talked about God the Son, and then today we're talking about the third part of the Trinity, what we call the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And I know this is a mystery, and maybe you're new to all of this kind of stuff, and you're like, well, I don't understand how God can be three in one, but we believe that God is a triune God. And it's a mystery very difficult to understand, but in essence, he has revealed himself to humanity in three different persons, and we call this the Trinity in the triune nature as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three manifestations of that God. And in essence, this means that we can know him as our Father and approach him as a child of God. But we can also know Jesus and approach him as our savior, as the one who relates with us, as the one that came in the flesh and blood that we share together. And we can know the spirit of God, relate with him, have relationship with him. He's the one that empowers and guides those that follow Jesus. And all throughout history, men and women of God, who God used to speak about him to humanity, described God through images, because it's impossible to fully understand God. In fact, we are limited beings, right? A a created being cannot fully comprehend the great creator. If we could, we would be God, and he is not God. But we can pursue him. And in fact, this is one of the most beautiful parts of our faith is the understanding that God is beyond comprehension, yet he invites us to know him, to pursue him, to try to understand him and personally have a relationship with him. But this one part of God we call the Holy Spirit, he's God himself, is also quite mysterious. In fact, if there's one part of my life that I most misunderstood in terms of my relationship with God was the Holy Spirit. See, I grew up, maybe like some of you, where I was in a household of faith, and I could understand, like, God is my father. Like, he's the one, I'm his child, I'm his son, and I could understand that. In fact, I I was taught that God is also Jesus, that Jesus came into the world, took flesh and blood, he died on a cross for humanity's sins, and then his righteousness becomes available to us because of what he did on our behalf, so we can stand before God the Father in right standing with him by his sacrifice and his grace. And I understood that. But to me, this third part of the triune God, which we call the Holy Spirit, was just an it. It was like, I know God's Father's personal, Jesus is personal, but then there's this it. And what happened because of that is I lived for quite a while my life and my faith life in a way that's kind of empty. Like, I would try to do the things that this book asked us to do, and every now and then I'm like, okay, I'm a Christian or I understand faith, but I didn't really have the power of God or a relationship with the Spirit of God, which is the one who directs us. And so there was a part of my faith that just felt empty. It felt like religion. And Jesus did not come for religion. In fact, religious people did not like Jesus. This might be news to some of you that are very religious here, but Jesus didn't come for religion. He came to build a relationship with us and reconnect us into a relationship with the triune God. And religious people didn't like that about him. 
And he wanted to show us, though, that there is a way to have a faith that's empowered. In fact, I would read my Bible and I would see, okay, well, the stuff that's in here is not in my life. And there's a, such a disconnect because I never really understood this part of the Spirit of God. And I hoped, even after I got awakened in this understanding, I was like, man, I wish someone would have told me this earlier in life. So today I want to tell you. I want to show you how the Spirit of God is the one that can bring that wind that might be missing in your sail. Or maybe that fire that you feel like is missing in your soul. Or maybe there is a breath that you feel like is missing in your lungs. That you're like, ah, there's something that's kind of empty in me still. And I'm pursuing something more. I know there's got to be more to life than what I have. Even if you already are a part of a religious system. There are so many people in religious systems that have an empty faith because they don't yet know the Spirit of God. So these men and women that wrote what now has become the Old and the New Testament of the Bible, they revealed God and helped us understand who God is through images. And the Spirit of God has many images in the Bible and the Scriptures as revealed to these men and women. But I want to talk about four of them. And if you're taking notes, I want to ask you to write some of these down. But the first image that we see as displaying the Spirit of God is the image of water. See, water is powerful. In fact, Jesus, when he walked on earth, had an instance where the, all these people were in a festival in a city called Jerusalem, the epicenter of their culture. And they were pursuing to be filled up and filling their emptiness. And on the last day, at the climax of this festival, Jesus stood and he shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and what? Drink anyone for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart and when he said living water he was speaking of whom say it together church he was speaking of the the spirit that was very weak he was speaking of the the spirit not a trick question yeah he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him notice all those words he said he come to me if you're thirsty like a water Rivers of living water will flow from within you. There's going to be something that fulfills that longing inside of your heart for more. And my spirit, he said, would be that one that would come not just as water for your body, but as living waters for your soul. The thing that we thirst for, that thing that you wake up every morning, like, I, I, there's got to be more to my life than what I'm experiencing. The reason you and I share that longing is because we were created to have the Spirit of God in our souls. Jesus spoke of this Spirit as the overflowing presence of God. And the Apostle Paul described it a little bit different as well. In fact, just like we are physically born out of the waters of our mother's womb, the Apostle Paul described our spiritual birth as a birth that comes out of the waters of the Spirit of God that renews us and gives us a new beginning. That's when we are born again, as the Scripture uh, describes. So he says it this way. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. And then listen to the word. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth, new life through the Holy Spirit. And he generously poured like water. He poured out the Spirit upon, upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. There is a pouring that comes into our soul when we come to Jesus. And the reason that the scriptures give us this image of waters because the spirit is the one who renews us. You see, when you have something inside of you that feels like it's just dead, like when there's soil that is dried up and it's hard to see life grow out of it, what it needs is water. And the spirit is that one who when you feel like there's something missing and you need renewal, like the ground needs to be broken up or the vessel needs to be washed clean, he is the one that can come and clean us. 
That's the story of my life. It's the story of countless people here in our community that he can take our sin and our brokenness and our past mistakes and use those as the very platform of our influence. He can renew it. He can give us a new beginning. And maybe you're here like in your last hope that there's some life that can come out of you. Someone invited you or you're a student in your college or whatever it might be. And you know, like I, I'm, I have very little hope for something significant. And I want you to know your past does not have to define your future. When you invite the Spirit of God into your life, He can take all of that junk, all of our mistakes, all of our addictions, all of our habits, all of the stuff that people said that disqualifies you from being used by God, and then He renews them all, and He leverages them for His purposes. And if you need renewal today, your prayer needs to become Holy Spirit, like a rushing water, like water into my soul and renew me. But then there's a second symbol, and the second symbol is just as significant. Not only does he come like water to renew us, but he comes like wind. And the wind is so significant in understanding the Spirit of God. See, in the book of Genesis, it shows us the Spirit of God already in the act of creation. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and empty. And darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of those waters. There's a Spirit of God in creation, bringing life, guiding the very voice of God in creating all that we see today. It's so interesting that in the Hebrew language, the word for spirit is the word ruach, which means wind, breath, or spirit. It's like there's a communicating to us that the spirit of God is the very breath of life. And when God created those first humans, what it says is he created them out of the dust of the earth, but then he breathed on them his spirit and they came to life. So then in the New Testament, in the first century, the common language then was Greek. And they began to communicate about the Spirit of God using this other term called pneuma. That's how, what they called the Spirit of God. And pneuma literally means spirit, wind, air, or breath. Which is why when Jesus came to the earth and he paid the price for humanity's sins, washing away this temple that we call our body, he then looked at his disciples after the resurrection and he says this, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then listen. It says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is so significant. See, because for thousands and thousands of years, humans could not have the Spirit of God living in them anymore. See, in that act of creation, when God put his spirit in us, humans were fully alive in a state of perfection with God, in community with a triune God. But then when humans sinned, that spirit that lived as our very breath, as the one that sustained the human life, had no, had, could, could no longer live in the human temple. And then we had to be kicked out of the presence of God. And ever since, until this very season when Jesus stepped onto the earth, humans just longed for the Spirit to come back inside and be our breath. But we, they, he couldn't because of this thing called sin. So God the Father said, I'm giving you a promise, humanity. And through men and women in all these generations, he promised there will be a day where the problem of sin that keeps my presence from being in your body will be solved. And that day, I will send my own son into the world, and I'm going to get that sin that you carry, that you have a consequence for, and I'm going to put that consequence on my son. And my son himself will bear that, that, that consequence on a cross, and then he will defeat sin and death and offer you life again. And life is the spirit. And then he said this. That promise of you becoming the temple of the living God, 
will be fulfilled among you when my son solves sin for you. No longer does the Spirit of God have to live in a temple built by human hands or in some ark and whatever else if you have to go to some church building. Church buildings are just buildings made by human hands. What God wants to do is live in you. He wants to live in the human temple. And so all the believers, after the resurrection, they, they were waiting. Jesus said, now I've solved sin. He was raised from the dead, and he looked at 120 of them. He said, look, you go wait in Jerusalem, and you wait for the promise to be fulfilled. So they're in this upper room. You can go to this region today and see where this happened. And all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly a sound came from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm just all over this room, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Spirit of God. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them this ability. And the world changed from that point forward. The Spirit came like the roaring of a mighty wind. And part of the reason we love this image of the wind that God revealed himself as wind to us is because the Spirit is the one who guides us. So you see, even in this one festival called the Pentecost, these believers were all lost. They don't know what to do. Jesus is now gone. But Jesus had told them, hey, it's, be- it's good for me to go because one is coming after me who you absolutely need and it's better for you. Speaking of the Spirit of God, so now they're aimless, they're without direction, but now in this moment, when the wind came, they knew exactly what to do. They stepped out of this room, and they had a new boldness, a new courage about them, and they began to be the voice of God around the people in them. There were 120 of them in the beginning, but by the end of that little uh, event, there were 3,000 people that committed to follow Jesus. If you need guidance... Or direction, if you need a wind in your sail, it's the Spirit of God who you need to invite into your life. He is the voice of God. He is the breath of God inside of you. If there's an emptiness or something that feels like it's just missing, there's an invitation on the table. It says, would you get to know my Spirit? One of my favorite moments of the week here of working at Echo is we have a prayer meeting on Wednesdays. And at 9 o'clock for an hour, our staff and leaders, and it's open to anybody, you're welcome to come. We meet in our warehouse at the San Jose campus, and we just pray. But what I love is we're not just talking to God. In many instances, we wait for God to speak to us. And those are some of my favorite moments when we're praying. And someone says, the Holy Spirit gave me a dream this week to share And he spoke and he said this and we were inspired. Or Others come and they say, I have a a word of encouragement from the Spirit. And they'll encourage you with God's word. Others will say, hey, I have a prophetic word, which is a funny word to use in our day. But a prophetic word is just when God gives you a, a word from his word to be revealed for others around you. You speak on behalf of God and it inspires, encourages you and directs your life. And very often in these gatherings, the Spirit is speaking through all these gifts of the people in the room. It is a life-giving part of our relationship with Him. And if you're here, you're like, I don't even know what it's like to hear God speak. I want you to know, this is why Jesus said, it's better for you if I go. Because one will come who will guide you. In fact, He said it this way, when the Spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth. If you want to find out who you are, what to do, it's a spirit that does that. He will not speak on his own, Jesus said, but will tell you what he has heard from the Father, and he will tell you about the future. If you want to hear the voice of God, invite the spirit to come. But he doesn't just come as water that renews us or as wind that comes to guide us. He also comes as fire. And this image of fire as described in the scriptures is so important for us to understand. In that event in the upper room, when they're all there waiting and praying, it says when the spirit came, 
what look like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Spirit of God. John the Baptist, who came to prepare the way for Jesus on the earth, he said it this way. He says, he, Jesus, will come and he will baptize you with the Spirit and in fire. See, this word baptize means to submerge. And what he was saying is, when Jesus comes back here, when he comes, John's preparing the way, when he comes He's going to be the one that's going to pave the way for you to not only have a little bit of the sprinkle of the Spirit, but you will be immersed in the Spirit of God. He will consume you like a fire. And what fire does is fire renews us. The, all these, fo- these people that came uh, into the, that were in that room when the fire descended, when they walked out of that room, they were different. They were now speaking with courage and with boldness. And those that came in shy came out with extreme boldness to proclaim the message of God. They started, they dropped their old ways. They began to help the poor. Their natural talents were replaced by supernatural abilities because the Spirit is the one who refines us like fire. He renews us. He also guides us, but then he refines our character. So when you say, God, use me, use my life, his invitation then becomes, let me cleanse you. Let me, ref- let me give you the character you need for me to be able to use you in a significant way. A few weeks ago, I was in a trip in Colorado, and I was in, in a, a lot of pain during this trip. Uh, and while I was in pain, I felt I was having a, a prayer time in my room. I was in, in a group in a big house, but I had my own room there. And I felt the spirit that was trying to teach me uh, humility through my pain. And I, I was wrestling with them in conversation with them. I, I felt him say this to me, like he's using my physical pain to teach me humility because I had too much pride. And so I'm, I'm, I'm having this conversation. And I, I said, well, well, spirit, is there another way to teach me this? I was tired of the pain that I was feeling. So I'm literally on my knees in my room having this conversation with the Spirit of God. And, and he, in my thoughts, he said one small phrase. He says, yes, you can fast more often. And I, I was like, is that God? I, 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 think, I think it was God. And, and it was really clear. He said, you can fast. See, fasting is a voluntary way for you to humble yourself before God so that you can be spiritually strengthened. So when you let go of eating a meal and you physically starve yourself in that meal to pursue the presence of God, your body weakens while your spirit is strengthened. And I felt the Spirit say this to me, if you, one of the things you can do voluntarily so I don't have to use outside factors to bring the humility that you need for me to do the things that you're asking me to do through your life is you can build a habit of fasting more often. Then I don't need to use all the other stuff that I'm currently using in your life, Felipe. So I got up from my knees and I felt like, okay, the Spirit gave me clear guidance. I called my wife. It was late at night. And I, and I said, hey, Mandy, I felt like the Spirit spoke to me. Uh, and he said, I, I need to fast more often as a way of bringing humility into my life. And she said, oh, it's funny you say that because uh, this, while you've been gone, I was waiting for you to come back to tell you this. But I felt the same call this week while I was at home. And then we talked on the phone and we said, okay, let's do it. Let's establish a habit where on Wednesdays, breakfast and lunch, most, well, most Wednesdays of the month, we're just going to abstain from food to pursue God and invite him to strengthen our spirit. The Spirit spoke to her in a different part of the country, the same thing he spoke to me. See, he has a way of refining our characters if we invite him in. And he'll reveal to you your pride like he did to me and my brokenness and my sin and all of those things he does so that we are positioned to expand our influence on the earth. He doesn't just do it for self-gain. He does it for an amplification of your purpose on the earth. But if you invite the Spirit of God, he does this. He comes like water and he renews you and gives you a new beginning. He comes comes like wind that begins to direct all of your life, but then he comes like fire and takes away all those impurities. And if there's a sin or an addiction or a habit that you cannot overcome, it's because you're not meant to do it without the breath of God in your life. I tried. It doesn't work. It doesn't work on your own. 
Invite the Spirit of God to be the very thing that in, renews you, that gives you the character trait necessary to live out your purpose. But the last symbol is perhaps the most powerful. See, he is water, he is wind, he is fire, but he also comes as oil. And the oil of God is a, a beautiful symbol that in the ancient days had more meaning than in our day. See, in the ancient days, they used oil like we do today for cooking and baking, but they used it for way more. Oil was used for healing wounds. So even in the story of the Good Samaritan, you see this happening where the person that was wounded on, on the ground, the, the other one that came put oil on them for their healing. So it was used for, for that. It was also used to, as fuel for lamps, for lighting a room or even a city. So torches and all this stuff, it was the fuel they needed. But one of the most important symbols of the old days that we no longer tend to do is that oil was used to anoint kings and priests. And this is a powerful symbol. See, the word anointing means to pour oil upon. And when a, a priest or a king was appointed in what they believed to be a divine calling to lead and represent God to the people, they would pour oil on them, and that oil symbolized their divine calling and purpose in life. And it symbolized the empowerment of God for that purpose. So the scripture says this, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with, say it together with me, all of our campuses, and with power. And then Jesus went around doing good and healing people and all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And the good news is this, that oil the same power that allowed Jesus to do good, to heal the sick, to resurrect people, to bring renewal to his society. That same oil is the oil that's poured on us. So the scripture says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you. You are the temple of the spirit of God. And so the oil that lights up a lamp, the empowerment of God comes into those that believe and follow Jesus, the oil reminds us that the Spirit empowers us. And if you've been trying to do life with your strength, and you feel like, man, I just don't have what it takes, it's because you were created to have the breath of God as the source of your strength. And when you try to do it on your own, you wake up in the morning, and you're like, hey, there's got to be more. There's an emptiness. There's a joy that's missing. There's a peace that feels really distant. There's a strength that you feel like you ought to have, but you don't have because you are missing the very breath, the very oil of God in your soul. If your flame feels small, it's like, Holy Spirit, come be my fire. If you need strength for a task in your school, in your college campus, in your marriage, in your relationships, in your workplace, it's the spirit that can give you that strength. If you feel like you're doing things with natural talents, but that there's got to be a spiritual gift and ability the spirit wants to give to you, he does. Scripture says that your father in heaven longs to give his spirit to those who ask. And all we do is we say, come, Holy Spirit, give me, bo give me boldness and courage Give me abilities that are beyond myself. I love how the Apostle Paul wrote this little phrase at the end of one of his letters. He says this, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. See, there is a grace that Jesus gives you and there's a love the Father reveals to you. But there is a fellowship, a community, a relationship that the Spirit invites you to. And maybe like me, you grew up understanding Father, Son, but you haven't built friendship yet with the Spirit of God. And this can be the very key to the empowerment that you need. But notice something in the circle of all these elements with me. Every single one of these elements, they speak to us in a significant way because everything here changes what it touches. 
the water, the wind, the fire, and the oil. And all of these elements are fuel of some sort for something. And it's like God is saying to us, the fuel, the source of life for you is in my spirit. And the reason Jesus came to solve your sin is not so that you can keep on trying to do religion without my power. He did it so that you can live out your faith with the very power of God. Don't settle for a powerless faith. There's an invitation for way more than that. So I have two challenges for you, Echo, for all of us. Challenge number one is this. You might want to write this down. Practice intimacy with the Spirit of God individually this week. And it might look like this. Maybe you need to change the way that you pray, or maybe you're brand new in prayer, and you start to talk to God in his triune nature. Father, I thank you for loving me as your child. Jesus, I thank you for being my Savior, for forgiving my sins. Holy Spirit, I want to invite you to guide me now. Guide me in the things I do. And even specifically, one of the areas you can practice this in this week is in what we've been saying to you in inviting people to at the movies. Here's why. There are people in all of our lives today who without an understanding of what we're talking about today, they will continue in their life without the breath of God sustaining them. And your invitation can be the difference in their eternal life. And so this week, as you take these little cards around, say, Spirit, who do you want me to give it to? What conversation do you want me to have? When you go to your school or your campus or your workplace or the supermarket, say, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to say? Who is it that you want me to to, to invite this week? Practice that kind of intimacy with the Spirit of God and watch Him use you. But then number two, a challenge for you is to practice engaging with the Spirit in community. See, this is really important. I don't think it's an accident that almost every single time the Spirit descended on people as recorded in the Bible, they were in a togetherness. They were in community. They were laying hands on one another. They were touching each other. They would often put oil on one another, symbolizing the transference of the Spirit of God into another human temple. And in that context, they were renewed. They had power come into them. Some of you today, you need that touch. And in just a minute, at all of our locations, we're going to give you a chance as we sing a song to actually have someone pray for you for one of these elements, these components of what the Spirit offers you. And just like in the first century, when the Spirit would come down as they prayed and laid hands on one another, often anointing each other with oil, The Spirit can come and begin something different in you. My life was changed in a moment like this. I was so thirsty for more of God. I already knew God the Father. I already knew Jesus. But I was in an environment just like this where a pastor said, there's more of God for you. There's a Spirit that wants to be in you in His fullness. And if you want that, come forward. And I remember I went forward. This little, little old lady, beautiful woman, came and spoke to me. And with her fragile hands, she put her finger on my forehead and prayed for me. In the next 30 minutes, my life was changed. I felt an empowerment and a peace that totally transformed me. You might be here and you need renewal. You need the spirit to come like water in your soul. And just give you a new beginning because you screwed up the past. And he's able to do that. You might need renew in your marriage, maybe in your vision for the future. Maybe you're starting a new phase of life. You need need God to be who defines you, the one who empowers you. And your prayer is, renew me, Holy Spirit. Others, you're here and you need guidance, like the wind on a sail. You need someone to pray for you and just say, Holy Spirit, guide this woman, this man. You need direction and discernment. And your prayer is, guide me, Holy Spirit. And you need somebody to pray for you for that. Others, you're here and you need refining. And you know who you are. There is a sin and a brokenness and a character trait that God's been trying to mold in you, but you've not been able to overcome 
And the Spirit today wants to set you free. He wants you to know He comes like fire. And the thing you've been trying to reshape in your character without the fire of God, it will not be reshaped until you invite the Spirit to come and refine you. But in others, you need empowerment. And maybe you've been walking in faith, but you are a part of this group of people the scripture predicted would happen, that they would carry religion without the power of God. And you're saying, I'm done with that. If I'm going to do this, I want to do it with the power of God. And there are gifts the, the Spirit of God wants to give to you. He wants to empower your tongue and your soul and your faith and your work and your abilities in life and your relationships. And he offers that to you. Would you stand with me at all of our locations before I pray? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. Our bands are going to start playing a song. I want to ask you during these few moments before they begin to sing, to even with a posture of closing your eyes with me, whatever location you're in, to start to say in your heart, come Holy Spirit. Make it a time to pray, to seek Him, to invite Him, to fill you with more of Him. And then as we begin to sing this song, if you need to be refined, renewed, if you need to be empowered or guided, there are team members all over our stages and our, our rooms and our locations, and they're wearing tags, they're part of our prayer team or our staff. Come forward wherever you are. You might need to ask people to excuse you as you walk through, but then just ask these people to pray for you and believe that this will be the beginning of a new journey for you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come to echo. Come to us. God, you don't want to live in temples made by human hands. You want to live in bodies made by the Creator's hands. So we invite you now, Holy Spirit, to refine, to guide, to renew, and to empower us in Jesus' name.
of Jesus. And so what we do right now is we just ask Holy Spirit that you would continually guide us. You would empower us. You would overflow out of us. And you would anoint us with your presence to do the amazing things that you have called us all to. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. 